So it's currently 9.02. Um, in the interest of time, I think that we're going to get things started. It's a little bit weird not having the visual cues, uh, knowing whether or not it's time to start. Uh, but I think that uh, I think that it's, it's probably time. <clears throat> so my name is Jen. I'm one of the PGY3 CCF PEMs. Um, thank you very much for joining me this morning to uh, have a quick chat on quick hits, a literature review on ED efficiency. Um, it's obviously a big topic and uh, it's a broad topic as well. And the goal today really is not to necessarily go through the theory, but more go through the practical points uh, when it comes to, you know, some of the high yield stuff that I found on my literature review. Um, I hope to present to you some interesting stats and I, I really hope that we can have an interesting conversation at the end when it comes to what people's thoughts are on our current ED efficiency, um, where we're at and where we can go from here. My supervisor is Dr. Elizabeth Haney, so um, I think that we're going to get things started. Um, I have no conflicts of, uh, of interest, as you can see here. So <laughs> this picture uh, <laughs> inspired me quite a bit as I was uh, putting this presentation together. Um, I think that the reason why, why, why it inspired me is because I, that's very much how I felt going through the, uh, the actual literature. Um, this is probably me right there, that guy, um, as I was uh, going through the 5,000 titles that I found when I typed in ED efficiency and emergency medicine on PubMed. Um, I have to say, when it comes to this particular presentation, it was very much of a group effort. I have quite a few people that I should thank. Uh, the first person that I like to thank is uh, Dr. McDonald for um, helping me narrow my topic. Um, I would also like to thank Dr. Doran for sharing with me his uh, talk on interruptions in the ED, which he gave for his own grand rounds a couple years ago in 2014. I'd like to thank Dr. Foxcroft and Dr. Mywald for the history lesson that they have provided me with when it comes to our own local um, experience when it comes to ED efficiency. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Lamb, Dr. Park, Dr. Mislick, Dr. Dreyer, Dr. Um, Jones, as well as Dr. Forrestal for their insights when it comes to um, some of their own practices in relation to ED efficiency. And finally, last but not least, I have to thank Dr. Haney. Uh, thank you so, so much. For, for your time, for your dedication, um, and, and for all your you know, thoughts and for helping me put together this presentation. So without further ado, let's get things started. In terms of the actual objectives of the presentation, I was thinking that we can do a, a dive into um, this topic. When it comes to the way that we're gonna be doing the dive, um, there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Uh, I decided to split everything up into subtopics. So we're gonna be taking a look at the relationship between efficiency and the ED physician with the learner, with the patient, and last but not least with the system itself. If anyone has any questions along the way, anything that you wanna clarify, please feel free to uh, unmute um, and, uh, and interrupt away and uh, we, can, we can take it from there, right? So before we dig into the literature, um, I did just want to uh, give a moment to the fact that as I was going through this, I realized that we have come a long way. So, you know, barely a decade ago, a little over a decade ago, there were studies such as this one, or even this one that were actually looking at whether or not having an EMR uh, may be impeding our efficiency in the emergency department. I think that this is a bit of a moot point that I'm not going to go into much detail today, because I think that everyone would agree here that electronic is really the way of the future from this point onwards, both from a patient care perspective and also from a medical legal perspective. Um, that said, I kind of just wanted to give everyone an idea of you know, where we came from and, and where we're going from here. And I put this graph on basically as a bit of a disclaimer and as a bit of a cautionary tale when it comes to um, everyone listening in, when it comes to the, uh, the evidence that we'll be discussing today. This is essentially an evidence map um, that is graphing the different types of uh, interventions that have been done over the past many years, as well as the studies. And as you can see, when you're looking at, at all these gray circles, basically what it indicates is that even though there has been much that's been done over the past decade or so when it comes to interventions that are aimed to improve efficiency in the ED, um, these maps illustrate that there's still quite a bit of gaps when it comes to the evidence. And many of the studies that I've examined 
them and actually leave much to be des to be desired when it comes to um, when it comes to you know whether or not additional resources were actually used uh, for their interventions. So you know many of the studies, even though their intervention had a positive outcome, it's hard to actually um, infer whether or not their re their results were realistic and whether or not they would be applicable to our local situation. On that note, uh, the first topic that we're going to be diving into is efficiency and the ER physician. Um, I did want to start off with a quote here, and uh, it's by Italian born um, American racing legend Mario Andretti, who's I think 81 this year. And he once said, if everything seems under control, then you're probably not going fast enough. So I think that he was probably talking about cars, uh, but when I'm looking at this quote, um, I do wonder if perhaps sometimes, you know, as emergency physicians are dealing with a queue of patients waiting to be seen, if maybe this is sometimes what the practice of emergency medicine feels like. Um, now, when it comes to EP productivity, uh, an interesting stat that I wanted to bring up and just, you know, for you to simmer on is the fact that in 2013, um, there was actually um, a journal uh, that published the fact that emergency department physicians spend only about 25% of their working time working directly with patients. So, you know, I think that begs us to pause and think about, so what exactly is it that we're doing with the other 75% of our of our time and you know is that other 75% of our time spent in a productive and efficient way and, and similarly I think that this graph that I pulled from a different study that is also very you know relevant and was very surprising to me is that when it comes to emergency physicians the productivity actually diminishes significantly after the first hour I think that we can infer looking at this graph that towards the end there are probably not patients that are being seen because we're trying to wrap up and this is the end of our shift but it's interesting how there's a big drop going from the first hour to the second hour and subsequently it plateaus a little bit. And I think that begs the question, is there anything that we can do to close this gap? And why exactly is it that the gap exists in the first place? I think that it would be unfair of me to talk about emergency physicians and uh, efficiency without addressing a little bit interruptions. Um, so when I when I think about this, you know, I think about the study that I read when it comes to multitasking. So the first thing that I wanted to clarify is that this study essentially defined multitasking as the performance of two tasks simultaneously. And essentially, you know, the bottom line is that multitasking is not exactly possible, except when behaviors become completely automatic, which generally speaking in an emergency medicine environment, rarely anything is completely automatic. Almost everything does require at least a little bit of thought. Um, and the task switching is essentially what causes disruption in the uh, primary task, and this may actually contribute to error. And this is a model of distraction that that study actually illustrated. Um, and I'm sure that this is not a model that uh, anyone would be unfamiliar with. You know, it goes something like this, where you kind of start your day, and the first task is you're working with a resident, and you're listening to the resident presenting a patient history to you. Two minutes into that, you get interrupted by a nurse and the nurse is asking you, you know, where is the blood work that you promised you were going to put into Cerner a couple minutes ago? And as you're about to start doing that, um, a critical patient rolls in. And as you're dealing with that patient, you know, your attention is definitely taken away, not only from the second task, but also the first task. So I think this begs the question, are there any strategies, cognitive strategies that one emergency physician can use in order, try to, in order to try to mitigate these, uh, these interruptions and the negative effect that these interruptions can have on your, on your flow? So this was a study that was published in 2017. And essentially, a couple of the strategies that they were mentioning include, number one, um, being prepared to resume. So for example, if you are you know, about to put in an order for a patient um, for a medication, and the nurse comes and interrupts you, what they recommend doing is in your mind, you know, recite the name of the patient and also recite the drug that you were about to give and then put your attention towards the interrupted task. And what that allows you to do is once you come back to the first task that you were su supposed to perform initially, it would actually um, permit for an easier resumption of that task. The second thing that they talk about is to create um, environmental cues, and that includes, you know, using memory aids that can serve as a reminder to where to start work after the interruption. So, for example, if you are going, you're on Cerner, you're on FirstNet, and you're going through, you know, a list of past medical history of a patient that you just saw when someone interrupts you, what you can do is you can actually place the mouse on the points that you were reading so that when you come back, you can actually have a, a visual cue when it comes to where you were, where you were at before the interruption. 
Now, exactly where is it that, uh, that a physicians are getting interrupted? Um, this study shows that it tends to be when physicians are around their computers. The data shows that more than 40% of the time, um, this is where physicians are getting interrupted. So, you know, I think that this also makes us think that perhaps computers should actually be developed in a way um, that they can more easily and more explicitly allow physicians to indicate on the computer itself when they're working on a task that is critical and they would prefer to not be interrupted. Um, so just food for thought and perhaps something for uh, future developers to, uh, to think about. Now, I wouldn't want everyone to, you know, go away from this presentation thinking that all interruptions are bad and no one should be ever interrupted because I think that interruptions are an intrinsic part of the practice of emergency medicine. Um, and I think that this was actually reviewed by Dr. Doran um, with, his, uh, with his supervisor a couple years ago in 2014, when he reviewed the psychology between, um, between in interruptions, uh, medicine, as well as uh, the practice of uh, flight decks. Um, so when it comes to what I took away from listening to his presentation is that not all interruptions are a bad thing. So for example, what his research showed is that when you're getting interrupted for some tasks such as, you know, like a not a very, not a very high risk task, for example, casting or suturing, and when you weren't going at very high speeds anyways, and you're, you know, those are tasks when one is doing, when they're letting their minds wander a little bit, getting interrupted during those moments can actually increase your productivity. Um, so something to think about, and I think that ultimately what we wanna take away from this presentation is that interruptions can be good or bad, and the most important thing is to be mindful of your interruptions, and perhaps to pause a little bit before you're about to interrupt someone, and to think, you know, is this really something that I should be interrupting them about right then and right then and there. Um, now, the next thing that I was looking at when I was looking into the literature for efficiency is, um, is the essentially, uh, is there a point when emergency physicians become less efficient? Um, and what was really interesting about the, the data that I examined is that the efficiency of an emergency physician actually caps at about 1500 hours per, per year. Now, this study actually plotted RVUs per hour against annual hours worked. And just to determine, just to define what RVUs mean. So this is, a, this is a unit that is generally used in the States as a billing standard. And essentially the way that this is calculated is this is a compound value that is calculated not only from you know, the, the amount of patients per hour that is seen, but it's also using um, you know, the acuity, um, it's also using the time of day. So it compounds many factors together and it's aimed to provide a much more objective value to, pro to productivity compared to, compared to just saying, you know, the number of patients that one sees per, uh, per hour. Um, this study that I looked at that was published in Academic Emergency Medicine in 2018 essentially looked at some of the high key efficiency practices of some EP providers. And the two things that I wanted to mention when it comes to what they found that was very helpful that actually surprised me is, you know, number one, there's obviously things like your patient load that it would that would affect your, your efficiency, you know, running the board that would also affect your efficiency. But the two things, the more soft skills that they were looking at is when you're actually addressing your team members by name and when you're actually communicating regularly with your team members that that would actually be um, very it would be very helpful to to your own practice as an emergency physician when it comes to your when it comes to your efficiency it's hard to talk about this topic as well without discussing the question of pay because we wonder you know is the dollar sign in any way associated to um, to an EP's um, productivity uh, and I think that I would want to bring to your attention this particular study that was published in 2018 that looked at the effect of a fee-for-service environment and essentially the takeaway from that study is that fee-for-service environment was associated with about a 9.6 minute reduction in wait time, which is, you know, definitely compatible with an, an extrinsic motivational effect, but this was not in any way sustained. So the conclusion from that study is that although physician compensation is an important policy issue, it's definitely far from being the primary determinant when it comes to ED operational efficiency. Something else that I'm sure many of us think about, and, and I also think about as a resident is, you know, 
is me, my asking a question to my supervisor, is that actually having a negative impact on their flow? So what is the effect of, um, of having learners around on the actual emergency physician? Um, I think that something that was really reassuring was proven again and again by many different study. Um, for example, this study that I wanna to bring to your attention was published in 2010. And essentially what they seem to say is that efficient teaching doctors actually appear to be able to perform clinical duties in a busy ED environment without sacrificing their ability to provide education. Exactly why that is may actually be examined in this particular study in 2007. And essentially what they determined is that um, when it comes to teaching scores that are given to um, emergency physicians by residents, um, you know, it's not exactly related to the, the productivity or how busy they are at all, but rather it, it's, it's the learner's perception of the, the attending physician's clinical teaching skills is whether or not they're actually willing to teach and it's the overall learning environment um, on like altogether that would have an impact on the, um, on the learning, on the teaching score that one would receive. And many other studies, I have to say, you know, would show the same. So I think that the takeaway from this point is that no statistically significant relationship between clinical productivity and teaching evaluation was found in, in any of these studies, to be honest. Now we're going to be delving into the um, second part of the, uh, of the presentation, which involves efficiency and the ED learner. Um, the first thing that I wanted to discuss is resident productivity. Now, um, before we go into that, when it comes to um, July phenomenon, um, I did want to elucidate that for everyone. So in case anyone was wondering, um, well, wonder no more, July phenomenon is uh, well and real. Um, this was actually demonstrated in a study in 2018, which evaluated about 100 EM residents during their first month of practice and their R1 compared to subsequently um, and their subsequent months of practice also in their first year. And they actually determined that there's about a 10 minute difference time when it comes to the average uh, door to doctor time. There's about a 35 minute difference time when it comes to the dispo time. And in terms of the length of stay of the patient itself, there's actually about a 50 minute difference time. So uh, quite, um, quite a significant Significant difference. But the positive news actually is that there's actually, um, they're quick learners. Um, and in the first year, as you can see demonstrated in this graph here, there's a huge learning curve. So going from July to April, and we're just going to focus on the, uh, on the bold line here that represents the EM1 residents, you can see that there's a steep learning curve. So even though at the beginning, they may be a little bit slower, the more time they spend in the emergency room, the quicker they catch on. And, um, and they pretty quickly, you know, catch on to, to their R2, to their R2 levels. And the same thing is demonstrated in this study here. Um, I'm not gonna you know, belabor this point in the interest of time, but essentially just to demonstrate that the productivity when it comes to PGY1s compared to PGY2 and PGY3s, there's a big difference, but they're quick learners. Now, this is an interesting point that I wanted to bring up, and this was a study that was published by Dr. Chan, um, medical education extra extraordinaire from, uh, from McMaster University. Um, the study was published in CGEM in 2020, and essentially was looking at exactly how to teach emergency department flow, uh, flow management. So, you know, I think that this is an interesting point uh, because um, I think throughout our training, the more senior we become in our emergency medicine training, the more we come face to face with this concept of, of flow management, which often seems a little bit abstract. Um, and I, I would argue that perhaps it's not always a concept that is taught or, or taught well. And I think that one of the key issues is that as learners, we often focus on the complexity of certain cases while the attending physician focuses on the volume. And the study, this particular study states that one of the most important barriers to effective teaching and learning of these skills is thought to be due to the lack of faculty, de faculty development um, in the teaching of this skill set. So basically, this was the basis that informed the development of the study. And they came up with this really interesting algorithm uh, when it comes to how to approach the teaching of uh, a flow and management in an ED. Um, we're going to go through this real quick. And as you can see, the first point right here um, states that when it comes to flow, before an eMERGE resident can flow, they must know. So essentially, 
for junior residents, um, you know, before they're, they should be entrusted with uh, this task of how to run an ED, they need to have a solid grounding on uh, the approach to managing some patients' core presentations. So junior residents really should be focusing on providing care to individual patients. They should be, you know, focusing on how to prioritize management decisions between different patients before they're asked to coordinate the flow for an entire department or a section of the department. The second thing that I think some of us may, you know, not be as aware of is the fact that we should be harnessing the power of observational methods. So keep in mind that that, you know, whenever you're around learners, that um, learners are constantly watching. Um, so I think that it's important to be attentive to, you know, ourselves as, as role models when it comes to um, patient flow. Um, they actually suggest that people should be using a think aloud protocol as you're making key decisions. And when you're making some key decisions with an administrator or with a charge nurse, you know, consider including your, your resident and, and having them come along. And this is part of a, what they call cognitive apprenticeship that really allows residents and learners to learn by understanding your own thought process. The third thing that they talk about is skill isolation, and they actually bring up this interesting concept of gridlock AD game, which McMaster developed and probably use uh, when they're teaching their residents when, they're, when it comes to flow. Right there is uh, Dr. Teresa Chan there. So something interesting that I think, you know, as a program here, perhaps we can also, also look into. And the last two points that they talk about definitely regard senior residents. And, you know, the fourth point basically says that with experience, um, you know, people become better at predicting the course of a patient. And then last but not least, you know, inside you coaching is invaluable. So practice makes perfect. And, you know, as residents are getting closer to the point of graduation, consider giving them a section of the eMERGE for them to run by themselves throughout their shift and consider checking in with them, you know, every hour or so to see how they're, to see how they're doing. Um, an interesting thing that I found when it comes to off-service residents that I just wanted to bring up really quick to your attention that you may find interesting is that there was a study that looked at how to increase off-service resident productivity while they were on shift in, emergency, in the emergency room. And they actually used this concept of shift cards whereby you know, they evaluate residents before the use of this card and then after the use of this card. And what they end up determining, as you can see here, when you're comparing this first bar with the second bar, is that by using the shift card, there's actually a little bit of improvement when it comes to their productivity per hour. Now, we're not going to go through, you know, these, these exact little points, but I did the calculation for you. And essentially, this translates to about a difference of one patient per shift when you're thinking of an eight-hour shift. Um, you know, one extra learning experience may not mean a lot when it comes to just a one, you know, one-time setting. But over the course of a block, of a rotation, and over the course of mentoring, you know, many different residents, I'm sure that this can add up. So it's definitely something to, um, something to also consider locally. Now, you know, at some point, I think that we, we start to think about does length of shift matter when it comes to efficiency and productivity? So this was actually examining the study that was published from Albany um, in 2007. It was a brief report, and they compared about 200 um, I believe it was a nine hour shifts with uh, about 112 hour shifts. And essentially what they determined is that even though the absolute difference um, is small, um, it was about 0 0.09 patients per hour in an ED with you know, between 100 to 120 hours of resident coverage daily, this difference actually results and any, anywhere in between nine to 11 additional patients evaluated by residents on a daily basis, which I think in the long run can definitely add up when it comes to, um, when it comes to the significance. Now, moving on to this classic, this is uh, one of the finest literature out there in, uh, in the medical literature, House of God. Um, this quote that I wanted to read out loud for everyone. So show me a medical student that only triples my work and I will kiss his feet. Uh, so this is the 11th law in case anyone was wondering in the book. And it clearly exemplifies this concept, this common belief that medical students or learners are probably a hindrance to um, expedient patient care. So, you know, that is a good question. And I think that the question is, you know, do learners actually slow the department down? And after examining the literature, I have to say that my reaction is kind of like this, like I'm not 
<laughs> I'm not too sure. Um, the evidence seems to be a little bit conflicting. And to summarize the evidence for you, it goes something like this. It seems that the more junior the learner, the more they tend to add up anywhere between seven to 20 minutes to the length of stay of a patient. But then again, there are other studies such as the graph that I pulled from here. It's, um, it's a graph that I pulled from a study entitled Impact of Learners on you know, the Emergency Medicine Attending. It was published in 2014. It basically demonstrated that attending physicians alone or attending physicians with a medical student, um, their productivity are very similar. Their productivity is higher with a resident. And this is regardless of whether the resident is a junior resident, an officer's resident, or a senior resident. So this is actually a compound value. So I think that the takeaway point from here is that regardless of you know, whether or not you know, these studies hold value or not, um, I think that I would counter and say that even though junior learners may take more time, they tend to do a much more comprehensive assessment. And one could argue that you know, the value of the learning they gain from the time that they spend with you, the attending in the, in the emergency department, um, um, is intangible and, um, and, and is not easily measured. So the third point now that we're going to be delving into involves efficiency and the ED um, and the ED patient. Um, so in terms of the first study that I wanted to present here, it's something that I was wondering myself um, as I was delving into the research. And that was, you know, if one is becoming more efficient and more productive, does it mean that the patients just don't like us as much because we won't be as nice? We're not going to be, you know, listening to them as much. And this study published in 2017 actually implies that the, that the physician patient's ability to establish a positive report with their patient is actually independent of their productivity, which I think is a, is a reassuring thing. Um, and moving on, the second point that I wanted to address when it comes to ED efficiency with the patient is this concept of swarming. Now, what exactly is swarming? So swarming, as you can imagine, involves the team together, including the learner, the attending, and the nurse, all seeing the patient as a collective. We've probably all done it. We've done it consciously, unconsciously. For example, a patient is very sick. So you just say, hey, you know, come with me. Let's just go see the patient together. Or, you know, we're in a situation where there's a bed block. There's not a lot of patients to be seen. So you, you know, take your learner with you and you guys go and see a patient together. So I think that now, you know, you can rest reassured that that practice actually has good, um, good evidence when it comes to, you know, not only family and patient satisfaction, um, but also learner education, specifically junior learner education, as opposed to senior learner education. Education, um, as well as efficiency. Um, so also something to, to think about if you do include this in your practice. Now, the last section that we're going to delve into involves efficiency and the ED department itself. Um, the first thing that I wanted to address here once again is the concept of, you know, finances as an incentive for an ED. Um, for this part, I found a study that was um, that was published in 2013, um, and it was published out of out of BC from the uh, Vancouver and the Vancouver surrounding hospitals. And essentially, what they did is um, the BC government at the time expected that, you know, if they were to provide incremental funding for hospitals, it would decrease ED wait times and also length of stays if the policies were, were effective. So they invested about $13 million between the fiscal year of 2011 and 2012. And for EDs that actually participated in the program, they got about $1.5 million per emergency department. The conclusion of that study was that um, the success did not seem to be very definite. If anything, I think the the program was met with mixed success um, in reducing length of stay in participating departments. So food for thought, and, and you know, maybe, maybe finances is not the end all and be all. And you know, tied in with that, you can think about design because very often we can spend quite a bit of money on redesigning an emerged department, whether we're designing, redesigning the flow, um, we're redesigning the amount of beds that we have in there. And once again, you know, we have to ask ourselves, is bigger always better? Um, this was uh, this was looked at actually in a study that was published um, that was published a couple years ago, and essentially what they uh, what they did was uh, they increased the amount of beds in a large academic center. It was done at the University of California. They expanded um, their number of beds by 60% from 33 to 53 in the eMERGE department, and then they measured whether or not it actually improved their efficiency. Um, the summary of that study is that not only did it not 
increase uh, their efficiency, it actually increased their number of boarded patients. So bigger is definitely not always better. And this was re-exemplified in another study here that was not done in a real life, but it was done as a sim. And they were essentially looking at, you know, the factors that can improve ED length of stay. And essentially what they modeled is that the rates at which admitted patients depart the ED have a bigger impact and improvement on the overall ED length of stay, whereas increasing the number of ED beds did not. Now, the one intervention when it comes to design that I really wanted to, to talk about um, that has quite a bit of evidence for is this concept of fast track. It's actually out of all my readings, and if you have one takeaway point, you know, let it be fast track. It is the one intervention that leads to the greater, greatest amount of benefits. Many studies have demonstrated the same, so I won't be going through, you know, all of them, but just to give you an example, this was a study that was published in 2006, and essentially in their department, um, they established a very strict criteria uh, when it comes to patients that can be eligible for fast track and a physician assistant in the you know, emergency department was dedicated to that section of the ED. And the results were actually quite um, astounding. So when it comes to the, the summary of the results, not only all domains of patient satisfaction were improved, they also noticed that the length of stay decreased from 130 to, to 15 minutes. So this is something that we actually brought yeah. back locally here to our emergency uh, departments. Um, and I think that it's nice to know that there's quite a bit of solid data supporting this practice to know that locally, you know, we're on a good path to, um, to solid efficiency. Something that I was that I also wanted to mention is as kids. Now I know at Victoria Hospital in the ED, you know, we don't see a lot of kids because they just go directly to um, the pediatric department. But you know, at UH we do see kids from time to time, and this is I think something that is applicable to you know academic centers that see kids or community departments or you know definitely pediatric pediatric departments. So there was this one study that was looking at a playroom internal waiting area. It's essentially acting as a fast track for kids because obviously we can't expect kids to um, you know, sit, sit in the waiting room as part of a fast track um, waiting room waiting for their results and waiting to be seen. But essentially they um, created this waiting room as, as a functional place where, you know, kids can wait uh, while they were being sorted out. Um, there was obviously also a list of criteria that would make them eligible to be there. So, you know, CTAS ones and CTAS twos definitely um, generally didn't end up in the waiting room. And they also found that it decreased length of stay up to 40 minutes, depending on volumes of inacuity. And obviously the benefits of the playroom and of a fast track in general is maximal at, um, at a department's busier times. The next thing that we're going to be talking about, and I do want to address this issue locally as well, is the issue of uh, EMRs. Um, so when it comes to EMRs, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is a dictation. Um, I did have the chance to um, talk to some of our local physicians when it comes to um, their practice and their experience with dictations. And initially what I got out of this um, is that you know, when it comes to studies, um, dictated notes uh, were longer than typed notes. Um, documentation time was similar when it comes to dictation versus typing. Um, dictations may take a little bit less time, but not in any statistically significant ways. Um, and last but not least, dictations generally had a higher mean quality score uh, and they were more mm -hmm. complete and included more sufficient information compared to um, type notes or, or definitely written notes. Um, so locally here, when it comes to dictation, um, what I gather is that not too long ago, I think there was a trial with the iPhone directly connected to FirstNet. The pros, I think, of dictation, whether it's with the iPhone or just in general, you know, once we, um, you know, go ahead and maybe have Dragon dictate and, and work with that, is that it's very nice to see once, you know, dictated notes immediately after the patient leaves the ED. I think that, uh, you know, printed records is to everybody's advantage at the end of the day. Uh, many people have mentioned that when it comes to patients coming into the ED, the ED feels a bit like a black box. No one knows what happens. So I think the dictations definitely address that issue. Um, dictations tend to work well when it comes to telling complex stories and resuscitations that were done. And finally, last but not least, you know, medical legally, I think the dictation definitely um, also uh, can, can, can help us quite a bit when it comes to illustrating the path of a patient throughout their emergency room course. 
When it comes to the cons, so it can definitely be a little bit clunky. Um, I think that there's a very steep learning curve with dictation and it can be a time trap for people who are not as used to it. And from a productivity perspective, it slows you down at the beginning, but you know, maybe this can change with a better platform. And, and you know, I do believe that there's been some talk when it comes to getting Dragon Dictate as a trial, but I'm not too sure you know, where that is at yet. And I'd be happy to hear everyone's opinion on where, um, where you think this may be going for, for us locally here. So the other thing that I wanted to talk about is typing. I think that there are many more people typing compared to people dictating. When it comes to typing on FirstNet, uh, in terms of pros, you know, for people who are quick typists, they feel like they're pretty close to their baseline when it comes to their speed typing versus charting um, by hand. Uh, this also provides timely communication. Um, you know, people have mentioned a good point, which is a reputation uh, for the emergency department, you know, to be able for other services to receive clear notes when it comes to what happened to the patient's the patient during their course in the emergency department, I think it's, uh, it's definitely positive for us as a, as a, as a specialty. Um, and this may sound actually highly unpleasant to some, to some people, but junior staff actually tend to really like the idea of being able to wrap up their charting at home. And uh, when it comes to some of the cons, um, the system unfortunately still isn't super well integrated with Cerner and FirstNet. So I think that this is something that is definitely a work in progress and something that um, Cerner and um, you know, EMRs can, can improve on in, in the future. A quick note on the concept of the iPad. There was an iPad experiment actually not too long ago. Um, the only thing that I wanted to point out that I'm going to readdress later when I talk about future points and where to go from here is we did have an experiment here. Um, I believe that it was uh, it left much to be desired. Part of the reason why it left much to be desired, it was because um, the biggest problem was that Cerner essentially didn't really have a functioning mobile touch interface for FirstNet, and it was very clunky to use, not to mention that for the mobile network, Network, very often the mobile network would drop and disappear and you would have to find yourself in a situation where you have to log in again. So it was a good thought. Maybe we can bring it back again in the future, but unfortunately with our trial here locally, it wasn't very successful. Something that I wanted to address quickly here is the concept of scribes. Scribes are definitely more popular in the States than they are here. And there's actually an estimation that, you know, in an eight hour shift, um, emergency physicians spend between 90 to 120 minutes on documentation. Now, when it comes to scribes, I think that we should think about first and foremost, the cost of training the scribe. So there was this study that was performed in 2016 and they estimated that it cost about $6,000 US dollars to be clear when it comes to training a competent scribe. Um, there are many, many studies out there, mostly out of the States, evaluating, you know, the efficiency of a scribe and how does that influence the productivity of an emergency department and of an emergency physician themselves. Um, and this is fresh off the press. This was published, I believe, in February, so, so just published in 2021. And it was a systematic review and meta-analysis on um, studies that have been done so far. Uh, and, and to conclude, the pros of having medical scribes include having provider satisfaction with a scribe. You know, I don't think a lot of people really like doing paperwork, so that's definitely a positive there. Uh, patients also tended to be quite satisfied with a scribe. However, despite the fact that scribes ten tended to improve, you know, those factors, um, there was not a clear improvement in overall length of stay. So perhaps, you know, part of the solution, but definitely not um, a big part of the solution. Now, something to mention that, um, that, I, that I've noticed happened in multiple departments across the province, so provincially, but also nationally, is when it comes to this concept of having physician and triage. Does having a you know, senior member of the medical team sit at triage help move patients along faster so that we can start work up for them and, and you know, move them along in the department? I have to say the, um, the studies that I've examined um, show pretty conflicting evidence. Um, you know, I think that this is a bit of a landmark study. It's a systematic review that was published in CGEM in 2020. And essentially the results were non-significant. So the time to the first medical consultation, obviously, was reduced, but otherwise it didn't actually have any significant patient benefit for patient flow, um, nor did it actually reduce the, the number of patients that left the department without being seen. So it seems like, you know, everything that we've kind of talked about so far point back to patient boarding and the bottleneck problem. 
A quick note on handoff. Um, I just wanted to say that locally here, we do have a uh, handoff policy on best practices. I'm sure everyone is aware of this tool right here, SBAR, uh, you know, quite simple and qu quite easy to utilize. Um, I just wanted to say that this was an interesting study when it comes to the quality of the handoff and how does a handoff actually influence efficiency and quality of care. And I just wanted to say that many of us may think, you know, if I'm spending a lot of time handing off, then I'm going to leave my shift later. And this is definitely going to be an impediment to my efficiency. But surprisingly, this study shows otherwise. So this was actually a study that was published in 2014. And they developed a dashboard sign out checklist. And what they determined is that definitely significant improvements were seen when it comes to reporting of the HPI, when it comes to reporting of the ED course, when it comes to, you know, the other person getting the sign over being more aware of the plan. Um, however, there was actually no significant change when it comes to um, increasing the time to sign out at all. So perhaps something also for us to, um, to, to consider when it comes to, you know, trying to minimize um, the tasks that we do that can um, impede our, our efficiency. Um, a note on clinical assistance. Locally, I believe that we know them as EDTs. Um, there's research about them as well out there. And the quick note that I just wanted to say is that they're there for good reason. Um, this was a study that was published that basically they called them physician navigators and they were evaluating um, their effect on productivity. And essentially physician navigators were associated with um, some modest reductions in door to physician time. And they were also reduced, uh, they were also um, related with a positive correlation with patients that less patients that left um, without being seen. Now, the last point um, that I wanted to talk about uh, may not be as applicable here in London. So the study here um, is uh, essentially with regards to physician assistants and nurse um, and nurse practitioners. Um, obviously, they tend to be much more prevalent in the States than they are here in Canada. Um, but I wanted to put this here because, you know, some of the residents may be graduating and maybe working in departments where they are present. Um, so just, you know, something to, to be aware of when it comes to the data and how they affect flow. And the data seems to be positive. So this was actually a study that was performed in six eMERGE departments here locally in, um, in Ontario in 2013. And they found that having um, these NPs and PAs actually reduced overall length of stay of patients by about 30% um, to 30% to 50%. And they actually reduced the number of patients that left without being seen as well. It fell, you know, anywhere between 44% to 70%. So something to something to be aware of. I wanted to close off the presentation with a note um, on the future uh, when it comes to, you know, where are we going to take things from here? Um, and the first thing that I wanted to say is that, you know, we're starting to think about e-facilities and, and granted before the times of COVID, I think that most of us would have thought that this is a bit of a moot point, that emergency medicine is a hands-on specialty and that we're never going to go virtual. But I think that, you know, COVID has definitely made us consider things otherwise. And even locally in the pediatric emergency department, they have started doing virtual, virtual care. Now, when it comes to things that are done virtually, the first thing that I will say is that research shows that emergency triage telephone services um, are definitely here present locally and they're available across you know many different um, many different countries um, internationally um, they have not been shown to help the emerge um, when it comes to overcrowding and they have been shown to be a bit of a drainage and resource as well um, when it comes to uh, healthcare management um, the thing when it comes to e-facilities that, you know, that we're thinking about is, you know, is there a possibility of having a physician that is working on shift, uh, but then also having them examine patients that, you know, call in locally. And essentially what happens and what these e-stations are talking about is that these health e-stations physicians are located in a different, completely separate facility, obviously, and they're treating their patients in the department, but they're also treating these patients at these e-stations and they're able to remotely examine the patient's ears, eyes, throat, and skin. So obviously they can't examine everything and nothing will actually replace an in-person meeting with the patient, but just, you know, food for thought and something to think about. 
And this brings me to the other point of the iPad that I promised you that I was going to come back to in the future, uh, because there's actually this interesting study that was published, I believe, out of Seoul in Korea back in 2016 that was measuring the effectiveness of near field communication that was integrated with a mobile EMR. So perhaps one day, you know, we will have we will get to a point where we can try this out again. And they actually did a sim with this. And, and the idea essentially was that they would create the scenario whereby, you know, you would have your mobile um, device and you would be able to scan these QR codes that would be located you know, along the walls of the emergency department. And this would allow you to minimize the amount of time and the amount of traveling that you're going to have to do between, between, you know, between the computer and then going and see the patient. And I think that this is definitely something that can be interesting locally where you know, I, can, I recall you know, at 4 p.m. at Vic, very often we have trouble finding workstations. So you know, perhaps a direction that we can move into in the in the future. And on this note, um, I thank you for uh, for your attention. We have definitely gone through quite a few papers. There are some things that I glossed over, but you know, like I said, my goal was really to be able to provide some quick hits on some high yield points and to avoid the theory because I felt like that would just drain everybody down and bring everybody down. But if you wanted any clarification of anything, um, I'm definitely uh, happy to entertain any questions, comments, thoughts. And if I don't know the answer, I will be uh, happy to find out the uh, answer for you. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I was really interested by the paper on swarming. Like you mentioned, it's something that I think we've all done uh, without perhaps a direct purpose behind it. Uh, but after hearing your paper and reading through it, it's uh, certainly patient satisfaction is exponentially increased with that by, I don't have to repeat my story three times to many different people. And then I'm fascinated by the concept whereby you're receiving the information um, as a team all together. We have the same uh, in, uh, facts to begin with. So now with my learner, if I do that, say once or twice a shift, especially with a junior learner, we don't have to focus on them telling me the facts. Now we can focus on the cognitive process behind it and how, you know, how I interpreted the facts, why I might then want to go down a, a different direction than they might have thought for the workup. I really, I really like the, uh, the basis of that for kind of creating more of a, like a cognitive decision discussion compared to just a facts discussion. So that, that I find fascinating. I think I'll incorporate that into my practice in a purposeful manner now. Yeah, absolutely. I was just wondering, you know, is there any staff who feel like they're already doing that now and they just, they weren't aware of the evidence and be nice to hear your comments on that actually. Hey Liz and Jen, great talk. Um, there's, um, there's some, there, there, you're right, Liz. There's so many benefits to that, including the idea that it's a team-based practice. So you're much more in tune with your nursing staff as opposed to getting kind of a, a partial handover from your nursing staff. The other thing that might be an un unintended consequence of it, um, and I've been in this scenario before, is a medical legal aspect. Um, so um, in, my, in my previous um, uh, work experience, we were doing team-based uh, or swarming basically. Um, and, and a patient complained. And, and the nurse's experience of that complaint was very similar to mine, which um, was, um, was very helpful in the, in the complaints process. So there are a lot of benefits to it, but I, I would agree that the idea of, of having multiple practitioners in a team-based fashion managing a patient is just uh, intuitively a good thing. Just a question about that uh, swarming technique. It's Mason here. Um, I didn't get into the logistics of generally how it's run. Like, I assume it's the physician asking the questions, or is it the nurse? Like, how, how does that work out? Does the physician's questions usually incorporate everything the nurse needs to know, or, or how much overlap is there between the information you're collecting? 
it tends to be the this is yeah that's a good question mason it tends to be the physician asking the questions um and i think that that is also where you know i think we must be cognizant of the fact that we need to pick and choose the cases that we do this for um i think that if you were to do this for every single patient that you saw then it doesn't leave room for the learner to, to learn and you know take their own histories um but but also i think that it's important to be cognizant of the fact that perhaps senior residents are kind of above that concept and would actually appreciate more doing things um, by themselves but it tends to be because you know the way that i would contribute to efficiency is that as one person asking the questions and everybody getting the same information and i think that what that does is instead of spending time afterwards on transfer of information you're kind of spending time on processing of the similar information which in improves efficiency may act and may actually, you know, contribute to learning in a completely different way. I was just wondering um, if I may, if I may ask, um, when it comes to people doing, doing dictations who, who did dictations, is there any news on, you know, are we going to be moving to drag and dictate at all or, or not? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll take that one since uh, you bugged me about it by email yesterday. Um, the, uh, the reality is with the, here, there's, there's a plan to move to Dragon. Um, there was supposed to be a trial with a few of us to give it a shot. Um, it has not happened. And, and currently, there's, there's been no real communication. I suspect it's, uh, to use the same excuse that it ran the world, it's COVID-related and resources have been kind of diverted. Uh, but it's been discussed. Um, the current uh, practice right now, the current kind of jump to hopefully go to EMR and uh, charting is that, um, you know, we have, they gave us this kind of power chart touch, it's called, and it allows you to be able to dictate into your phone. Um, it's a little bit choppy. It's not bad, but it's not... It's, um, so we're looking at it, uh, but it's a bit of a different coster uh, on top of everything, which is why we haven't moved to it right away. I do know systems kind of like Chatham Kent uh, and uh, the rest of the Southwest Ontario to Windsor and Kitchener places have that uh, kind of all included. The bigger difference here is that there's uh, a lot more people and learners, which ups the cost kind of quite dramatically. So uh, that's kind of the summary point on there uh, and where we're kind of moving with it at the present. Gotcha. When it comes to um, when it comes to typing notes, I was just wondering: is that um, and, and anyone can answer this question, obviously. But is that is that something that you know people can just get on board with whenever they want? Is there any training for it? Um, and and you know, what's the impediment to you know most of, most people just going ahead and, and doing that at this point onwards? Well, currently, as it stands right now, the um, anybody can just type a note. In what's called an emergency department uh, report. Um, like you, you can do that right now. If you go to like clinical documents and hit the little plus symbol and hit add, there's a training component anybody can do to get this. So you can do that now, anybody can do that. You need to chart in different little widgets, if you will, uh, automatic colon information and have a note type is long way in I think we're losing you a little bit here. I don't know if it's just me. Is anyone else also experiencing it? Yeah, okay, it's not just me, gotcha. But if you want to get into the dynamic component, which is supposed to be the more efficient way, which is you kind of type as you go throughout the resuscitation or you type throughout the care, kind of auto pull in some labs, that's uh, that's something that you can certainly do. Gotcha. Is there yeah, a comment on that a little bit as well? If you want to get set up with it, there's a, there's a lead um, IT person that can set up the staff right now for it. Um, and I used to, I want to comment one more thing on dictation. I used to dictate uh, like how our consulting services dictate their admission notes and consultations and such. Um, but I found that, you know, sometimes saving those until the end, I would forget some of my reassessments and, you know, the whole course in the emergency department. And there's a delay in transcribing those because it's not in real time, unlike drag into first net. Um, so I do prefer from the typing aspect nowadays. Just another comment. I don't know if the Microsoft Word version we have in the hospital is the most up-to-date one, but actually Microsoft Word has a dictation um, 
like possibility on there too. That actually isn't horrible. So I don't know if that's something that you can just copy and paste it from a Microsoft Word document into your note. Yeah, you can do that workaround. That's that that is totally something feasible. The uh, the problem is with any computers at the hospital, uh, there are no probably no microphones on it. Um, so that that is kind of your barrier in the short term. But if you really want to go home and dictate into a Microsoft Word, copy and paste and transcribe, that is certainly a feasible way to get around it. It's just probably not an efficient way. Yeah, and also, um, oh, sorry. Um, a lot of internal medicine people use like the advanced clinical note to do their admission notes as well, where they use Microsoft Word, but all our WOWs and our emergency departments, most of them don't have Microsoft Word, and a lot of them will crash if you try to open advanced cl clinical notes. So that's also a barrier. Okay. Yeah, the thin, the thin clients are uh, uh, no bueno for most of this stuff, unfortunately. Gotcha. Having used the, uh, the Dragon version of FirstNet in like the Chatham region, I can say that this is much nicer from my perspective than dictating a full note because as uh, you kind of hinted at, you, you can do things in part as you go, you can modify it. It's not like the need to power through the entire thing uh, and you see in real time what you're doing and, and you can edit it yourself. So I feel like it's got less of that mental barrier to dictating a note in one go and it lets you dictate as you go and I find it more efficient than typing by far. Yeah, I'll echo that experience. Um, I used to uh, dictate with Dugtail, which Epic, um, not server based, but an epic based um, EMR when I was a trainee in Hamilton. And it's, yeah, it's really efficient. Uh, and it's great to be able to, as you mentioned, add in your note as you go uh, and actually see it pop up on screen. The nice or not thing about that as well, depending on how you get it, is that consultants could actually see your partially finished note, uh, regardless of whether you published it or not in that particular system. Um, and so they can sort of follow along, if you will. I don't think most of them did that, but some, if there's somebody very keen thinking that a particular patient is going to do that, you just want to be making sure that your note is unpolished as you're doing your dictation or reading. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. I, uh, first of all, lucky you sound like a half robot to me. So I apologize if that was my connection, but the, um, I half robot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're in the three quarters today. Um, the, um, the other real time thing. And I, I think a lot of the earlier adopters have loved the ability to die in like ha document efficiently, but like specifically you referred to a service, you spoke with the service. This is what happened really in the emergency department. This is what happened in the recess and the notes there in real time for the service. And it makes, such a world of difference where at least later they can't say this is what happened. I think we all have felt that aggravation on the consult note the next day that you're like WTF, they were seen by the eMERGE doc and immediately ICU took over. You're like, yeah, you know, immediately took over two hours later, but that's fine. Um, and it's really, really satisfying to be able to like write stuff. And I don't mean passive aggressively, but just objectively that this is what we actually did. Downtime was X, this was Y. Um, so that was, um, I, I do find it a very beneficial or a very complex story, psycho, uh, psychiatry or otherwise to be able to dictate those rather than type is huge, right? Because you can kind of say your words, um, the benefit of putting it with a, a station while you can dictate with dragon and see it is that when you say something that maybe doesn't transcribe as well, you can kind of go back and backspace and highlight and do other things. And it makes it so you can really make the note what you want. So there's a, there's a ton of benefits there. Um, you know, the other probably piece that I'll share that we all identified that was gonna be uh, for us to go truly online is the ability to scan certain documents. Um, realistically, EMS reports, consult notes, form uh, certain forms or otherwise, being able to have that image recognition on the computer because there's our note plus all the other maybe uh, giant package that came from a nursing home is really important that you want that to be face forward, but you don't want to write it all. So I think if you want a successful EMR implementation, you need good uh, typing ability and uh, like uh, uh, as well as dictation and image. And then from a hardware standpoint, you need the right computers and microphones with a good setup. Those are your kind of winning formula to actually transition to online. Thanks for sharing that, Dr. Mislik. So in the uh, interest of time, I hope Dr. Haney will allow me to do this. It's, I guess, just turned 10. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for, uh, for joining me today. Um, and, uh, and I think that we're just gonna end things here. I hope that you, you know, take away a couple of pearls and um, be in touch. Thanks. Thanks, Jen, that was a great presentation. Thanks, guys.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks.